You're listening to Out of Line with Caroline Lee, exploring offline realities with online personalities. Elsie Larson is one of the OG bloggers and social media mavens whose blog, A Beautiful Mess, just turned a whopping 10 years old. If we converted blog years to human years, that'd be like 92. But Elsie didn't just stop at blogging. She's joined forces with her sister, Emma, and together they've published two books, created two apps, including my personal favorite phone editing app, A Color Story, and most recently, they launched a product line called We Fresh. Elsie lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and so we hopped on a Skype call for this chat. Welcome, Elsie. It is so fun <laughs> to have you here. I, I'm so excited to have the the South Midwest uh, represented. Are, do you go? Do you consider yourself a Southerner or a Midwesterner or neither? <laughs> Um, uh, God, I mean, I consider myself from the Midwest, I guess, because I grew up in Missouri my whole life and moved to Nashville two years ago. And I mean, it is more Southern here, but I don't know. I can't say y'all in a sentence without, um, <laughs> you know, faking it. So I don't think I'm legit. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Okay. Well then I, I can say you're, you're repping for both a little bit here. Today, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I love Nashville. It's, it's the best, but, um, uh, truly Southern. No, <laughs> I love it. Well, <laughs> welcome. It's so fun to get to talk to you today. And I know you've been in, in the midst of a amazing and I'm, and very long process of, of adoption. So how's all of that going? Yeah, um, thank you. So it's our almost our 15th month. It is crazy how, um, you know, long <laughs> you just have so much time from the beginning and the, to the end to kind of get used to the whole process. Um, and there are different phases and stages and we just entered a new one just within the past few weeks. I know a little bit about process of the past few months because I think we started talking maybe a little over a year ago when I was in Nashville and you, yeah, yeah, you were like, I think we might adopt. And I was like, oh my gosh, amazing. So I've been sort of watching and listening and alongside of that whole process. But do you have kind of an overview of what it was like? Like, did you always know you wanted to adopt and kind of going from there, just like a brief overview of what that process was like? Yeah, totally. Um, I think I did. I was one of those people who always thought, oh, I'll have a couple of biological children and then maybe I'll adopt a couple children. Like I always wanted to have a lot of kids growing up and kind of just imagined that I would love to adopt, especially from a foreign country. I think some people just kind of know that they would be down for that from the beginning. So this past year when we started, we had to choose a path. The first thing you do is you you can't just like be in every program at once. You have to choose your program. And so we chose the China program, which these days is uh, pretty much exclusively a special needs program hmm. um, because a lot of things have changed in China. They have a lot fewer adoptions coming to the U.S., and they no longer have the one child policy, so they have domestic adoption now. Oh, wow. I didn't even know that. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, it's kind of in the last 10 years it was phasing out, I believe. I hope that I'm correct. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we started that process, and it was supposed to be an 18 month process, and it, it does feel like, I mean, it's, it's a couple years, and it feels like it. So the first, like, I don't know, four to six months, you're working on your home study, which is the part you kind of have a local social worker, and it's the kind of famous part where they come to your house and make sure that it's not hazardous, um, and it's kind of a little bit uh, intimidating. And then after that, you do your dossier, which is kind of similar paperwork, a lot, lot of medical reports, a lot of little pieces of paperwork about your whole life, your marriage, your family, background checks, things like that. And that goes to China. 
And after that, um, several months later, then you get logged in in China, and then you're eligible to be matched with a child, which is where we've been since May. And then this past month, we were matched with a child. And so now we have uh, just sent our letter of intent, and we will be adopting this specific child later on this year. Um, we're pretty sure before Christmas. So oh it's my gosh. kind of the worst part to the best part in like the past week. Wow. That is, that is incredible. That feels like, that feels like such an exciting, uh, kind of turn in something that's so long. And there are so many things that come up for me when you talk about the process, because on one hand I'm thinking it takes 18 months. And in that time there, I mean, I know that there's so much red tape, but there are also so many kiddos that, you know, are kind of like caught up in that waiting game with you. Like they're waiting while you're waiting and, it's, it seems so crazy that it takes, you know, twice the amount of time it takes to have a child like biologically for nine months to actually adopt a child. That's crazy. And then the other thing that I think is so fascinating is just that, that when people have a a child, no one comes to their house to make sure that they're, that they, they're, you know, fit to have a child. And it's like so fascinating that we're just like, hey, we need to just come into your house and make sure you're going to be good parents. That is such a really interesting thing. So were you stressed about that or was it, was that really intimidating? Uh, No, it wasn't. It was, it was fine. Like we had a great social worker and she was nice and we didn't have to, we didn't have any like red flags or anything, but I do feel like it, is kind of an unfair process because people who are lower income have a really, really hard time adopting. And there's all these other things, like if you've been divorced, if you've ever been arrested, just lots of little things that happen in people's lives that don't necessarily disqualify you from being a great parent, Mm. um, that just gives you these huge extra hoops to jump through in the process. So I totally agree. Like, I wish there was more of a balance, although I wish the balance was more on the other side of it, you know, with biological kids, obviously, Uh, um, to be protected. Yeah. 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 No, that's a really, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Um, so, okay. So I would love to hear more about the special needs program. So when you say that really the only program in China is special needs, can you tell me more about that? Yeah. So, um, when you start the process, you get this giant checklist. I think it has like 40, conditions on it. And some of them are really specific conditions that you already know a lot about, like HIV or I think of ones like tuberculosis, things like that, that are like common and easy to Google. And then a lot of them are super vague. Like I remember one of the boxes said like missing finger or hand or arm. Wow. And that was just one box, you know, and then the same thing for like a leg or, you know, so It is kind of probably one of the most soul searching things my husband and I have ever done together to go through that list. It took us months. Like, uh, I know some people just are able to just check things and move on, but we weren't that way. We would, you know, we had to talk to many different medical professionals and Google things over and over and over and like learn about things. But through that process, and then also just meeting other people who have done this program we, our eyes were really opened up to how special it is to adopt children with special needs and how much less scary it is than we initially had thought. Wow. I, I would love to know. Um, I know, I know Jeremy and I know that you guys have such an amazing relationship and you're both so creative. So was it something that you both kind of knew right off the bat, this is the, this is the path we want to take or did who brought it up first and Was it something Hmm. that took the other one a while to warm up to? Yeah. um, Okay. So how it happened for us is, I think this is how it happens for a lot of people, but we had been following a friend of mine when we were first married who adopted a child with a cleft lip and palate. And hers was, um, it was still unrepaired when they came home from China and she posted lots and lots and lots of pictures of it. Mm. And 
it was adorable and it kind of erased a lot of fear I think that people would normally have I mean maybe not for everyone but the way we felt when we were watching it was really really inspired and it it just made it seem like this is not scary at all we would totally do that and so yeah Jeremy was the person that brought it up to me one night when we were like sitting in bed and I was showing him a picture of the little girl and he was like I think I want to adopt a child with special needs so ever since then we kind of had it in our back pocket you know and then when it came time that we were ready to adopt and everything in our life was kind of aligned we just kind of we knew it was it was what we wanted to do wow Wow. That's amazing. I love that, you know, in this, in this podcast, we often talk a lot about social media and the roles that it plays in, in real life versus kind of like created life. Um, Mm -hmm. and I, and I love that this whole process for, for you guys has been very influenced and inspired by someone's real life journey that they've shared on social media. That seems to be yeah, very much so. Yeah. That seems, that seems to be one of the really positive things that I've heard, um, where it is, it is true. I mean, online life does influence our offline life and for you to kind of experience the, the human real, I know that person and I know their experience is real and to be inspired by what they're, what they're creating in their real life and allow it to really impact the choices that you're making in yours like that. Those are real lives that are getting impacted by that. It's not just, this is a pretty picture. Um, so that's, that's really amazing. I love that. Um, I love that story and that, and that, that is how you decided to go this route. Did you guys talk about having your own kids versus adoption at all? Or was, has it just always been, let's do this. And, you know, Jeremy said it and you were totally on board right away. Mm. Yeah, so we did try to conceive for a couple years, kind of on and off, but it wasn't like how some, I've read a lot of people's stories about infertility and things like that, and like it wasn't a tragic part of my life, it wasn't like a horror, like I, I was, I really didn't cry, I don't think at ever about it, which is super crazy for me because I'm a pretty big crier. (laughs) So we kind of just took that as a sign and didn't really read into it much that maybe we were just meant to adopt. And then once we started, we kind of never looked back and now we're planning to only adopt for our whole family. Wow, cool. And you you guys are you guys are planning on still having a biggish, biggish family? (laughs) Biggish. Um I mean, we just decided to kind of like get two kids, you know, live that life for a little while and then decide. So I hope, I mean, I I don't know. At the moment, it's been such a like um, emotional year where I kind of had like a lot of grief and a lot of like yearning, I guess I would say, that um, I want to have like 15 kids right now. So I'm not really in the mental space to decide. Right, right, right. One at a time for sure. I love that you're sharing this. Thank you so much, by the way, just because I'm, I'm sure this is still such a raw process and, and it is really personal and vulnerable. So thanks for being willing to share about this. And I, I guess even with the, the list that you're talking about, the list, you know, getting a list of like, what can you handle? That to me is such a, it's kind of a real, it's such an overwhelming thought that it's kind of, it makes me just like want to be quiet for a minute. Like the idea that anyone would just get a list of like, what can you handle? You know, because even that, Mm -hmm. like even that, we don't get that in real life. Like when you're, when you're having a biological child or when you're marrying a spouse, there's no like, okay, you know, 10 years from now, they might have these diseases. Which ones can you handle? So, so it's such an interesting kind of like ethical conversation. It's, it's very interesting to me that you would get to just kind of go through it. And it doesn't surprise me that it would take you guys months because it feels very, it feels heavy and, and sort of serious, but I also like, these are real lives that we're talking about. It's not just like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not just like uh, some sort of create what you want. It's like, no, these, these people really exist. 
Yeah. So no, I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. So like, what was that process like besides, you know, you were saying you were talking to healthcare professionals and you guys were mm-hmm. Googling things. Was there any other part of the process that really stood out to you as you guys decided what, what's right for you? Um, I guess first I would say like you, when you first get the sheet and you're starting to check things off and you know, it feels kind of like good, like you're able to choose, you do like realize later on that like, ultimately this is still a human life and this, their, um, diagnosis could easily be wrong Mm. or change over time. And you're really not like, you're kind of, you're choosing a starting point you know, that's hopefully accurate, but you're really not like getting to, um, completely control your child's condition. Nobody gets to do that. Mm. But yeah, once we kind of got into it, we decided to just kind of let our hearts open slowly and we would talk about each thing. And sometimes there are kind of fears you have to face. Like we really started to understand like the parenting side of, you know, that, that people don't want anything bad to happen to their kids because it's almost like you're projecting that it's it's something like, it's something you can't shelter them from, or it's something bad that's like happening to you, you know, that you also have to kind of like live through that. Um, so it is, it is pretty scary. Some of the things, you know, require, um, care, like ongoing care forever And some of them are things that you hope that you can fix with one surgery. Mm. Um, So we just kind of decided to face it, you know, one at a time. And when we would feel, you know, because this was months and months, like it, we had time to like change our mind and we did several times throughout it. Mm. Um, So if we would kind of feel our heart start to open or maybe like read a story or I was reading tons of blogs, you know, that there's people who adopt are really good about blogging, at least while they're in the process, they're like really on it. Yeah. And then they seem to quit the day they come home. Oh no. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so I read tons of, you know, just the, the process that people went through to just be able to bring their child home. And yeah, definitely you feel your heart change. You feel something like you, you realize that you could handle something or face something that you didn't think you could. And I think that that stuff is really important to listen to all throughout the process. And really, I mean, throughout your life as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So with the list, are we, I mean, is this like, are we talking like a page or how long, like, are, is this, is this pages and pages? Yeah, it's just, it's just one page, it, and it is each item is either like a word or a couple words, not more than a sentence. So it's very vague, and it kind of just lists all the major conditions that the children in the country we're adopting from could have. And then there's also a list at the end that's like kind of like stay open to other things, you know. Yeah, like a lot of them are things that you you're not really going to be able to know if it's a big deal or not until down the road. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, um, so you guys finished your sheet and then sent it on over and then what happens next? Like what, what's the rest of the process like? So, um, for the rest of the process, you, you would just wait. Um, and then one day you'll get a call every month there, the agency is getting new children and they are calling families, um, kind of in order of how long they've been waiting. But we, but in our program, there was also these emails where they would spotlight a child. And that's how we found our child was that actually it was a condition that initially, my husband wasn't, um, a hundred percent on, so we hadn't put it down. And then when he saw the child, he changed his mind and he emailed in kind of without telling me (laughs) asked for more information. And then, yeah, that was how, um, we came to get her info and have the option to adopt her. Wow. So yeah, it was crazy. It was like one of the most, I would say most beautiful marriage experiences, like seeing his 
his heart open up like that was, it was, uh, I can't even describe it. Oh, wow. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So who's choosing if you match, like, are these, are these birth parents that are choosing or, um, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so China's program is unique because like if you adopt a child domestically, then kind of the parents choose you. Right. And they like mm-hmm. kind of get this little book to read about your life. Um, and yeah, I've heard a little bit about that from my friends who have done it. I've never um, done it, but in China, it's still illegal to, uh, to give your child up for adoption. So all of the children are abandoned. Mm -hmm. Um, some of them in the street, um, our daughter was left on the, um, porch of an orphanage. So it was a lot more, um, like, 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 um, they found her right away and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a scary thing. And, Um, so you hardly ever get to meet their parents. And I mean, I've, I've heard that it could change like, you know, with, um, biological testing and things like that in the future, Mm. but you do have to adopt your child knowing that they might never be able to reach their parents. And at some point that's going to be a huge hurdle in their life that you have to help them overcome. Mm. Yeah. Is there, is there kind of a, when you go through an agency or a program, do they, do they kind of support with books or do they say like, watch these talks or videos or is there, is there sort of emotional preparation support, um, that they provide for you? Yeah. Um, for us, there's been, you know, some classes, lots of books, um, just some homework type of, um, things that we've been through to kind of train and just like learn about, you know, a completely different country and different laws and different processes. But for the child, I, I mean, I know that there in Nashville where we live, there is this kind of like culture, I don't know what you call it, like a culture club, like a club where they can, uh, be with other adoptees from their country and take like classes and stuff. Hmm. So we're definitely going to do that because I think having uh, friends who share a similar origin to you could be really helpful down the road for our kiddo. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't think it's one of those things. I think it's probably going to be hard no matter what, you know, Hmm. and you just have to prepare for that. Yeah, for sure. And, and yet on one hand, I want to say like, oh yeah, I I think, you know, it'll be hard. And then on the other hand, I, there's also the, the optimist part of me that says, well, you know, there are so many people that adopt now and there is so much more acceptance in families that are all different, you know, mixed races and adoption and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, like even just like marriages that have different kids coming together and like family, in air quotes, looks very different now to what, you know, a lot of expectations would have been like a few decades ago. Um, And so I guess my hope is that it will be easier on people um, who, especially, you know, like your, like your kiddo from coming from a totally different culture and country. um, But just that, that there will be acceptance and love and that um, it won't be as as difficult, obviously there, I can't speak to it cause I, I will never understand that fully, but my hope is that there will be a lot of support and love for all of you, for all, for your, for your whole family. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I think that that's something that, you know, um, it's been a, it's been like a, I don't know, hard, hard year, like to be an American and everything. But that's one thing that I've realized that I wasn't grateful enough for is that people here are determined to support diversity and embrace people who are different. And it's not like that in every country in the world. Mm, That's true. That's true. That's good. (laughs) Especially these days, it's good to remember why we're grateful to be, (laughs) to be right. Yes. (laughs) Because there's lots of reasons not to. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if I've told you, um, some of my friends here in LA, they're a gorgeous gay couple that I love so much. And they've been together for like 27 years and they adopted a daughter from China. Um, and she's a senior in high school now. And she also is someone who, oh, yes. yeah, I think I maybe mentioned them to you cause they're amazing. Um, and I, they're so open about adoption and what, what that's been like for them. And, um, with their, 
with their oldest because they have two children that they've adopted. And so with their oldest, um, she, like you said, she was found, I think she was found on a gas station step in China. And so then she got taken to an orphanage. And when she was, I think, a sophomore in high school, they took her back to the orphanage where she grew up for the first few years of her life. She's created like a nonprofit where she works, um, works to kind of support the kids that are growing up in the orphanage. And um, so she's like a really amazing and inspiring young lady. And it's someone um, beautiful. Yeah, it's someone as you're as you're telling me your story, it's reminding me of some of the things I've heard about her journey. And um, she's such an incredible woman. So Um, I'm really excited for you to hopefully maybe when you're in LA next, I can introduce you guys because she's very inspiring and oh, yeah, I'd love to meet them. Yeah, yeah, it's it's cool. And there there are people who've who've gone before. So um, there are people that I'm sure, you know, will will be excited to be an open book as you go through this next phase. So so I guess what is next? Like, now that you've been matched, is it? Yeah, like, tell me about that. Um, so now we have kind of a little, uh, paperwork hustle for the next couple months. Um, there's more, um, immigration things to do once you kind of know the exact child's name and everything to kind of prepare them for that. And then just travel and all that you have to, I mean, we're going to be there for two weeks and probably during the middle of the holiday season. Wow. So yeah, just for, so our whole world all of a sudden is just kind of getting ready for that. So I, I don't think I'll probably think about much else this season. I mean, we have a ton of stuff going on in our business, which luckily most of it is kind of like ready to roll and already, you know, we've been prepping for two seasons. But beyond that, I probably will be just so focused on this for a while because it's pretty consuming. Mm. Yeah, so... Yeah. Do you feel comfortable talking about the list of different mm-hmm. things? What um what special need does your your child have? Yes. Um so our child has albinism and the big things that kind of come with that, like obviously they have like white hair, white skin, um, and you have a sunscreen routine that you have to be fiercely committed to. But really, it's vision. So people with albinism have, I mean, for the most part, some type of vision impairment. And we won't know what level it's at, but a lot of people who have it are legally blind. So we're kind of just preparing for that for a child that kind of has functional vision where she can um, see well enough to like run around the house and play on a playground. But little things are going to slip by and little things are going to be challenging. She'll have to have modifications in school to be able to see, you know, and learn to read and write and everything. So, yeah, we're just kind of immersing ourselves in learning about vision um, impairment right now, which is, it's crazy. It's, it's very new to us. Cause like I said, it wasn't on our list. We basically changed our mind at the last minute after, um, we saw the child and Jeremy just, just couldn't let her go. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's so beautiful. How old is she? Um, so she's two. So we're also kind of, you know, getting ready to have a two year old, um, in an instant. So (laughs) yeah, big, it's a big, um, yeah, thing to prepare for, prepare our home and just kind of be ready to jump into like we were taught. I mean, we've, this has really only been a few days since we officially like decided and have, you know, started filing all the paperwork and everything. So my brain is still catching up to it. And I'm still like, oh my God, I'm going to have a child at Christmas, you know, on Christmas morning this year. Like it's like very unexpected and it's a lot to take in, um, all of a sudden. So, wow. That's so exciting. Yeah, I mean, I shouldn't say unexpected cause you know, we were expecting it, but this is sooner than it, it happened really fast. Hmm. Um, we were kind of settling in for a long wait and then it just happened. Wow. Wow. That's really, um, that's really inspiring and exciting. I feel like 
even just in having a two year old, I mean, does she I'm assuming she doesn't speak any English yet. Is that is yeah. That- um, so the file says that she can say up to three word sentences. And yeah, of course, just Chinese. So Jeremy and I are, were doing this app called Hello Chinese. And um, it's actually really fun. It's kind of like a game like, you know, the the app. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, where you're like, it's kind of like an intellectual, like, game app. Yeah. Um, it's oh. in that uh, category. Sorry, my phone's ringing. No, it's okay. um, where you kind of like, you feel like you're kind of like beating levels and stuff. Okay. So we're working on learning like super, super basic Chinese and hopefully, you know, above a two year old's level by the time we travel (laughs) in a few months. And, um, but yeah, we've, we've heard from everyone who's adopted a kid who could speak that they have learned English within a matter of either days or weeks. Wow. Like it's shocking. So so yeah, I, I'm excited to see it firsthand because I have never done anything like this and language and children's brains are just so crazy to me. They are. They're so crazy. And it, it's so amazing how quickly children learn things and, um, and you know, especially when they're young enough that their kind of hardwiring isn't totally set yet. It's they're so amazing. Like brains are so plastic. I don't know if that's the right word, yeah. but I'm going to pretend I'm a neuroscience from nice. <laughs> I'm going to pretend I'm a neuroscientist and I'm going to say the plasticity of our brains is fascinating. I don't know if that's the right word. If it's wrong, then too bad. Um, but that's so exciting. Um, so then when you bring her home, is it just the three of you on a plane? Like, it's just like, okay, we're doing this. Is that how it works? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You have to... You have her for a couple weeks in China and then to face the international flight (laughs) together. Wow. And yeah, I heard a lot of people just kind of be like, just survive. It's fine. You know, like, so I'm, I'm definitely like going into our trip to China with pretty low expectations, like not expecting it to be like, you know, a movie or anything, you know, like Mm. I'm expecting it to be hard and just kind of gonna hold on to the good moments you know Mm. um but yeah because I mean it's like uprooting a child like everything she knows in her life everything she's like all of her routines everything she loves that's familiar um her friends and the adults who she trusts she has to lose all of that in one day Mm. and then feel maybe in some ways kind of kidnapped by strangers so like I I've kind of like internalized that and I know it's going to be a a crazy um probably rocky experience but yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah, I I mean I don't I don't know. I haven't it's funny cuz I I know so many people. I have so many friends who've adopted but almost all of them have been domestic. Um and so mm-hmm. I don't I don't I don't really, I haven't really heard anyone share this process and maybe it's something that people who are in the process of adoption share, you know, on their blogs until they actually adopt and then they stop talking about it. But I've never actually heard anyone tell a story of this is what it was like to bring my child home and this is what their first flight was like and this is what, you know, no one talks about that aspect of it. And yet I'm sure it's very emotional. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of things that happen. I mean, if it was if it was me, I would be emotional just thinking about what the child is going through. Like like in terms of yeah. my own my own empathy would be like, oh my goodness, this is so intense for them. Mm-hmm. And yet I'm sure there I mean, is. Yeah, yeah. And yet I'm sure their process is not necessarily to sit there and think about it in those terms. So I'm, um, is, is this something that you've been sharing publicly kind of along the journey? Yeah. Um, we've been kind of, we have a, a family blog and, um, it's, it's just for fun. It's called the Larson house. And we just, I've been trying to share on there mainly just in case, people later on in the future, you know, adopt and they need, um, something to read. (laughs) Like they can learn little things from it. And I've learned so many little things from 
other people's journals um, through their processes. So, yeah, I, I feel like very open to sharing it, but it is a lot. And so many people know so little about adoption that it does feel kind of wrong on social media or on my my uh, regular blog, A Beautiful Mess, to kind of launch into it, you know? Mm. So I do keep it a little bit lighter just because, you know, when you haven't thought it all through or you don't know all the details, you can't really possibly understand, you know, how hard it is for the child or how maybe tedious of a process it is for the parents. Yeah. Well, thanks for being, thanks for being willing to talk about all the 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 real stuff um is there anything else in terms of the the process that has been surprising to you or or even just things that have come up in your relationship with Jeremy that um you know has been something that you weren't you weren't expecting to happen mm-hmm. Well, I mean, the whole process, I feel like has changed our lives completely. Like we can look back on, you know, a year and a half ago and feel like we were different people. Like in a way we, we were less grown up. We were less open to, I mean, kind of facing scary things, staying open to them. Um, definitely like less educated, you know, cause this, this whole thing, it was so eye opening, and I felt like a big part of our, our responsibility was just to get educated and, you know, take our time and stay open-minded. So I don't know. I just look back and think we were kind of naive, you know, mm-hmm. but I mean, you would have to be until you've been through it. It's, it's not a bad thing. It's just true, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. But no, it it's just been like a a really beautiful beautiful experience. Um like I I don't want to influence other people to do what we did, especially when we were midway through. I was like, I don't want anyone else to adopt from China cuz it was so hard and so long and so discouraging and there were months where it was almost like I f- almost felt depressed. It was so, um, difficult to get through. So I was like, I don't want to just only share the happy things and then influence people to, you know, take this path. Yeah. But now that we're kind of coming into the light a little bit now, I'm like, Oh, they'll be fine. You know, (laughs) it's like you change so fast on if you think it was worth it or not. Mm. So I don't even know, but I hope that if, I mean, I think that people know in their hearts already whether or not they are open to just adopting in general. Like a crazy number of people aren't, you Mm -hmm. know, and lots of people have been like not afraid to tell me, you know, that just like I would never adopt, Um, which is fine. You know, like people who don't want to do it definitely shouldn't. Right. Right. But um, I think when I just would say to people, like, if you feel your heart opening, kind of just follow it and see where it leads because it has been one of the best things of our life, the best experiences of our life. Mm, That's so awesome. When you say that you guys were so naive, I mean, I feel like that's, that's me. I'm in that boat. And, you know, it's something that I would love to know more. It's obviously if I'm not going through the process and needing to become an expert in it, it's something that I would love to just know Kind of like, what do you think is important for the average citizen to know about special needs adoption? And is there kind of something that sort of a takeaway that you that you could say, I wish every American knew this or, you know, in order to not be a naive person, it's really important that we're all aware of this. Is there anything like that that you can you can kind of verbalize? Yeah, well, and honestly, I still feel so naive. So it's, it's, um, we're, you know, we haven't even like picked up our kid yet. So it's like our, you know, experiences only go so far, mm. but, um, but I do, I feel like, you know, when you see someone who's adopting, um, just don't say anything negative, like a surprising number of people say something super weird, or they have like one story that they've heard of something that happened bad and they'll like tell it to you. Mm. And it's better. I think, um, I think it's better to just treat people like it's the same 
as being pregnant and that there is no difference and just kind of put that in your mind and don't forget it because no one really wants to get like treated weird right you know totally absolutely. and I'm sure that for the children as well like I I haven't parented one yet but I'm pretty sure that they just want to be treated normal as well so um you know adoption I think is more rare than I thought it was when I first started it it made me realize that you know most people they've only met a couple people in their whole life that they know of who were adopted and sometimes you know they have this this one bad story or this you know thing they heard on NPR or you know what I mean yeah and that's like their only experience with it. So I guess just going into it, realizing that that's where most people are at protects you in a way. Um, so now we feel like we're much more active on, like you got the email that I sent to friends and family about our daughter last week. And it was very like educational, right? Like we just want to like kind of answer people's questions before they have time to like speculate not know what to say or yeah feel nervous about it or something they can just like kind of get all the information and I think that when you adopt you kind of take on that role of educating people about it in general about your child about um your about how you want to be treated and you just really have to become ready to advocate for yourself and you'll be fine <laughs> mm. Yeah. And I, I think it's really interesting that you say it's almost like in the midst of your process, you also have to let people know what you need and you also have to let people know. It's almost like people are asking you to be responsible for calming their fears while you're in the middle of your own process, which is really interesting. But, but I love that just kind of like treat it like someone's pregnant. Like don't, don't be weird. That's it's so for some reason, I don't know why it's so hard for people sometimes not to just be weird. Um, and, (laughs) and just like say strange things that they think are okay. Or, um, and I know everybody's having their own reactions and their own experiences that just like naturally come out. But sometimes it's, it's okay to have a filter (laughs) and not say those things, especially to the parents. That's the thing that I'm like, Oh my word. Why do you, why do you think that's okay? Um, and, and I do think that adoption is something that's more, uh, it's becoming more common. And even in the past year, I've had three friends, um, adopt and all three of them adopted children, even though they're domestic, uh, births, they are different races than what the adoptive parents are, which again, goes along with my idea that I just think the, the picture of what the American family looks like is totally different now. Um, and so it's been amazing to watch their process. And um, like you said, their hearts are cracked wide open. Like there is, mm-hmm. there is no difference in my friends who have had biological children and my friends who've adopted and the way that they are obsessed with their children. There's not a difference in the world. Um, and the way that they love them so, so intensely is so beautiful to watch. It's really, it's really Mm. inspiring. Um, and it's really, it renews excitement and hope in humanity to just see, because we should, we should be taking care of each other like that. Um, we, you know, we really should. And in my ideal values, um, we do, we take care of each other. And if someone's in need, we take care of them and treat them like family. Um, so I think it's really amazing. And, I'm super excited to meet your daughter when she comes to live with you. I can't wait. I, I think you're going to make the most amazing mom. Um, and even just watching you as an aunt. Thank you. Oh my gosh. You're like the, you are like the most, oh my gosh. I don't know any aunts that love their, love their nieces like you do. You're just like, okay, my life is on hold and I'm in full aunt mode, which is amazing. Yeah, no, thank you. I They are little angels. Oh, my God. <laughs> I can't wait to have that summer camp again next year with our kid, too, because it'll be, yeah, it'll be crazy. Oh, crazy. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> and I love that um, that you are sharing a little bit about your, your process and your journey, like I was saying before, with, um, you know, this adoption for you being something that was influenced by the Internet, I think that is one amazing thing about social media is that I'm sure your journey and your process will inspire other people to do the same because things are a lot less scary when, when you know someone who's been through it. And 
um, especially with, with someone like you, um, who has a really large following, there are a lot of people who feel like they know you, which is, which is funny and weird, I think. Um, cause there are lots of people that you probably never even met who would say, oh yeah, I know this, I know this girl who adopted, right. you know, yeah. and, and it's funny. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that you'll inspire a lot of people and even just have them Thank have you. a good story. Like, cause like you said, people hear one bad story and they're going to just like shut down mm-hmm. completely. Um, so t- yeah, I think it's worth it to share it all just to kind of give people a new point of reference and expose them to, you know, a different side of it. Like just how my friend did that in our life. So, um, yeah, I think it's worth it to share about this for sure. It's, it's been great. Amazing. Well, I'm so excited for you. Congratulations. Freaking heck. You've been going through this for (laughs) so long. It's amazing. I'm so excited for you. Um, and I can't wait. I can't wait for you to have a Christmas, your first Christmas with your daughter. So exciting. I know. I, my brain can't even imagine it right now. It gets, it's unbelievable. It's really happening. Oh, so good. Stick around for part two of this discussion, where we'll dive into the online portion of social media realities. This episode of Out of Line was produced by me, Caroline. All sound editing, engineering, and original music composition by Jaden Lee. And a big thank you to Cat Footwear for working with Out of Line this season. Hit subscribe to get the next episode on your mobile device when it drops next week. And if you love what you heard, please whip out a review, will ya?